Skoda is getting serious about SUVs. Proof of that comes in the form of this Qashqai-sized Karok model, a strong contender if you're looking for a spacious five-seat C-segment SUV in this class. It gets all the latest Volkswagen Group technology, including a high-tech MQB chassis and cutting-edge safety and infotainment features. In theory, then, there's everything you might want from a modern family-sized crossover of this kind. One size fits all. Well, it's a good concept, but it isn't always an ideal long-term strategy. Skoda used to offer one car, the Yeti, for anyone who wanted any kind of compact SUV. These days, though, the brand has specific models for specific areas of this growing segment. And if what you need is a Qashqai-class family hatch-based C-segment SUV, what the Czech brand hopes you'll want is this model, the Karok. It's a half size bigger than the Yeti was, making room for a smaller B-segment Fabia Super Mini based SUV to slot in beneath in the range as part of a now much more complete collection of Skoda crossovers. Now the lineup culminates with the bigger seven seat D-segment Kodiak model, which lends not only its K and Q naming theme, but also much of its look and feel to its only slightly more compact showroom stablemate. And if you're interested, the name Karok comes from the language of the Aleut a tribe native to Kodiak Island in Alaska, who commonly use the word karak for car. Now, the last section of that word, rak, or more commonly in Aleutik, ruk, apparently describes an arrow. That's a symbol central to the Skoda brand logo. So the name is logically derived and so is the marketing justification for the design it designates. While the larger Kodiak is something of a niche player in the SUV sector, the Karok is targeted right into the heart of its fastest growing segment. And this part of the crossover market is growing by about 11% year on year against a current overall decline in car sales of about 5% and will account for around a third of all new car registrations this year. So it could hardly be more important or more densely populated with competing models. And that includes two that share this Skoda's platform and nearly all its engineering, say it's Attica and Volkswagen's T-Roc. So how can this Karok stand out? Well, Skoda tells us that ride quality, versatility, value and practical family friendliness are its core attributes. Plus, there's a kind of upmarket technology and infotainment connectivity that you might not expect from the brand. Will all that be enough to competitively take on the Qashqai crowd? It'll be interesting to find out. Have an SUV crossover model has come on in terms of drive dynamics. I mean, it seems like only yesterday that cars of this kind crashed through potholes, lurched through corners, and generally displayed a disdain for supple springing and anything approaching driving enjoyment. Uh, try some contenders in a segment and you'll still get some of that, uh, but not here. Don't get us wrong, there's nothing sporty about the Karok. It leaves that sort of thing to its say it Attica cousin. And you certainly won't be looking for excuses to drive the thing, uh, but the ride and handling combination that Skoda's engineers have reached here is truly impressive. Now apparently it took months of painstaking calibration to get it right and the effort has certainly paid off. It also helps that Skoda's chassis settings tend to work well in this market, having been designed for the Czech Republic's terrible tarmac and for the potholed roads of the many developing countries that favor the company's products. Now, in our experience in this segment, only a uh, Peugeot 3008 can match the Karok's ride quality, but by comparison, that SUV turns into something of a convection from the sweet trolley through the corners. Uh, in contrast, aided by its sophisticated MQB platform, the Croc can, uh, if required, attack the bends with confidence and even with a few occasional flashes of enthusiasm. It's a strong showing and one that you can refine through judicious use of the drive mode select system that all models feature if you're able to progress uh, beyond entry level trim. Now this is one of those setups that allows you to alter the uh, throttle response, the steering feel and on the DSG auto models, the gear shift timings to suit the way that you want to drive. Now there are three main options, eco, normal and sport, plus there's the option to add in an individual setting if you want to key in your 
your own parameters. Uh, Skoda has also developed an X-Cross DCC dynamic chassis control system, uh, which can also allow this package's various settings to influence ride quality too. The engines on offer are much the same as fitted to this model's VW Group clones, the Volkswagen T-Roc and that aforementioned Seat Attica, uh, which means that as with those two SUVs, the range is propped up by a 1 litre TSI petrol power plant provided in a 115 PS state of tune and mated to front wheel drive and a 6 speed manual gearbox. Now Skoda gives you the option of 7 speed DSG automatic transmission too. Either way, a diesel like efficiency showing is matched by a pleasantly purposeful revy note and a willingness to rev as in the manual model 62 miles an hour is reached in 10.6 seconds en route to 116 mph. Now those rival T-Roc and Attica models sell most strongly in this form, but a Karoc weighs 60 to 70 kilos more, and that's extra bulk that hampers this feeblest engine quite a lot with its relatively meagre 200 newton meter torque output. Which is why we, like Skoda, expect the strongest selling Karoc variant to be that uh, powered by the next petrol engine up in the range, a 1.5 litre TSI power plant which offers 150 PS and thanks to efficient cylinder deactivation is virtually as clean and frugal as the lesser unit. There's 25% more pulling power with this variant and whether you go for manual or automatic transmission, performance feels even more willing than the stats suggest. Uh, in a manual model you're looking at 62 miles an hour in 8.4 seconds en route to 127 miles an hour. There's also the option of four-wheel drive with this engine. There are a couple of diesel options too, uh, the usual 115 PS 1.6 and 2 litre TDI units familiar from just about everything the Volkswagen Group makes and again these power plants can be mated to either manual or DSG auto gearboxes. Uh, the 1.6 TDI makes 62 mph from rest in 10.7 seconds en route to 116 miles an hour so that's around about the same as the base 1 litre TSI petrol unit uh, but it mates it to a lustier torque figure of 250 newton metres. It's the 2.0-litre TDI variant, though, that you'll have to have if you want four-wheel drive and a diesel Karoq. Now, you can talk to your dealer about a 190 PS version of this top engine, but we're trying it here in the 150 PS guys that buyers are more likely to want. In the manual transmission four-wheel drive form that we've got, in this case, 62 mph takes 8.7 seconds en route to 121 miles an hour. And pulling power jumps to 340 newton meters. That's enough to raise the brake tone capacity to 2,000 kilos, half a ton more than you get further down the range. If you are a tower, then that optional 4x4 system will probably be of particular interest to you. So let's tell you a bit more about that. Uh, buyers in this class don't want fully fledged off road capability, so Skoda hasn't delivered that here. In fact, as is usual with four wheel drive systems of this sort in cars of this kind, uh, forward propulsion comes conventionally from the front axle during regular motoring, with the rear axle partly decoupled until it's brought into play by an electronically controlled multi plate clutch when a lack of traction demands it. Packaged up as part of the 4x4 setup is a more sophisticated multi-link rear suspension system to replace the cruder torsion beam setup featuring on the front driven models and you'll feel the benefit of that uh, on particularly broken surfaces such as those that you'll find off-road. For slippery driving, the 4x4 package provides a couple of extra settings for the drive mode select system we mentioned earlier. And if you are venturing off the beaten track, it's the off-road mode that you'll want to turn to. And that's selectable via a button down there by the gear stick. Now, pressing this will focus all the car's electronic systems for off-piste use. And uh, it introduces hill descent control to ease you down slippery slopes. But don't get too ambitious once you venture onto the mud. Uh, the Karoq's car-like monocoque chassis doesn't offer much in the way of axle articulation. Uh, plus there's obviously no low range gearbox and no way of manually locking the differential for the really sticky stuff. On top of that, even in a 4x4 version of this car, the ground clearance is no more than a decidedly modest 176 millimeters. Now that explains the distinctly modest off-road stats, an approach angle of up to 18.4 degrees and a departure angle of no more than 18.7 degrees. 
in the unlikely event that you'll be putting these figures to the test by copying the adventurous families featured in Skoda's advertising and taking to the rough stuff on regular weekend expeditions, your dealer will recommend that you equip your Karok appropriately. Uh, an optional rough road package includes an engine guard and an understone guard. All well and good, but of course you're far more likely to appreciate the four-wheel drive system's capability throughout the various conditions that you'll meet on the road. Now the 4x4 package also includes a further snow drive mode select setting for slippery mornings and with this activated on such days you'll uh, really notice the extra stability it gives the car through the corners as the clever software uses the multiplate clutch to vary the amount of torque being sent to the rear axle. But enough on four-wheel drive, let's uh, summarise what's on offer here. If you simply don't need an SUV as big as Skoda's Kodiak, then this, this look-alike showroom stable mate, may be just what you need. On the highway, refinement's impressive. In town, it's manoeuvrable and easy to park. And when you're pushing on, the drive dynamics are very difficult to tell apart from those of an Octavia family hatch. As we said earlier, the ride and handling combination served up isn't particularly exciting, but it is very Skoda. In short, the brand has put its distinctive mark on this design and in a class of copycat SUV rivals that can only be a good thing. If at first glance you mistook this Karok model for its larger Skoda Kodiak stablemate, then you're in good company. At first, we found ourselves doing that too. Get to know the styling of this more mainstream SUV a little better though, and the differences between the two designs uh, begin to become more readily apparent. Uh, for a start, it's a substantial 315 millimeters shorter than a Kodiak, and it's significantly narrower and lower too, although you'll find it much bigger in all those dimensions than the brand's previous yet model if you're graduating up from one of those. It's in profile that the Karok's individual identity is perhaps most distinctive, with a taut, agile look emphasised by short overhangs and a roofline that dips uh, gently towards the rear of the car where it intersects with the angled D-pillar. This mid-level so-called tornado line helps with that too, as do powerful lower door creases, deep black sills and accentuated flat top wheel arches that house rooms between 17 and 19 inches in size. Uh, we've got the 19 inches here. It's all far more Kodiak derived here at the front, primarily because the way that the dual slat radiator grille flows into these crystalline headlamp units is very much the same. Now these incorporate features inspired by traditional Czech crystal glass art. They include these outer LED daytime running light strips and they can, if required, be ordered with the dazzlingly precise beams that mark out full LED technology. Now a feature more unique to the Karok is the way that the secondary light apertures below blend neatly into this chiselled bumper crease. We're not quite so keen on the fake grill texture plastic below, but this full width low intake helps to give the car a more assured planted look. Razor sharp detailing also characterises the rear, designed to be jauntier and a little more extrovert than the rather conservative tailgate you get on the Kodiak. Uh, the quite dramatic cutaway design of the taillight assembly uh, helps here, the LEDs illuminating with a distinctive C-shaped nighttime signature. Now this hatch features this angular crease line that sinks back to create a smooth recess for the number plate light, the rear view camera and the tailgate switch. As usual of course, uh, What's rather more important is the stuff that you can't see. In this case, that's the MQB platform this car shares with similar sized Volkswagen Group C segment SUVs like Volkswagen's T Rock and Seat's Attica. When we got behind the wheel of this car's Kodiak SUV showroom stablemate, we told you it was the classiest Skoda cabin yet made. Well, the inside of this Karok is just as good. True, there are a few cabin materials that appear to have been chosen for durability rather than for premium feel, but overall the interior is beautifully put together. It's smartly designed and easy on the eye. Chrome fascia highlights and shiny piano black trimming around the centre sack lift the ambiance above the usual rather spartan feel of some of the Czech brand's other models. And on a top variant like this one, restrained LED ambient lighting and lovely stitched leather upholstery deliver something of the kind of finish you might imagine you get in a premium brand crossover.
You always know you're in a Skoda, though. Uh, for one thing, the instrument dials you view through this smart three-spoke wheel feature the company's usual distinctive grey outer rings. And for another, the cabin abounds with plenty of the company's famed Simply Clever design features, which, um, well, they just make life a bit easier. Take this jumbo box between the seats, which incorporates this neat reversible tray that flips over to reveal cup holders, cubbies and ticket storage slots. And what other family car provides you with the opportunity to add in a rubbish bin to the door pocket or includes a standard, an umbrella beneath the front passenger seat. The company has also done its best to give its own look and feel to the centre infotainment display, but despite that it's recognisably a stock Volkswagen Group item. And none the worse for that, uh, this classy glass fronted monitor is supplied in 8 inch form on most models, but it's also available in this larger and more advanced 9.2 inch Columbus guise, where it also includes the facility to operate various functions using gesture control. Either way, you'll find that the touchscreen deals effectively with the usual DAB stereo, Bluetooth phone and car informational functions. And with all trim levels, it's embellished with uh, Skoda's clever Smart Link setup. Now, this allows you to access the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto mirror link systems, which can duplicate your phone handset's display onto the monitor and then allow you to use various apps. And you can also talk to your dealer about pairing up this whole media system with a fully digital instrument display. If you specify your Karak with the higher grade Amundsen or Columbus infotainment packages, which include navigation and Wi-Fi, then you can really get into the advanced connectivity that Skoda these days is offering through its optional infotainment online and Care Connect packages. Now, infotainment online gives you online traffic information and it can update you on things like uh, fuel prices, parking spaces, uh, current news and weather. Care Connect, meanwhile, will allow you to monitor your car from your smartphone via a Skoda Connect app. Plus, the setup includes um, a breakdown call function and will automatically alert the emergency services if the airbags go off in an accident. What else? Uh, well, getting comfortable is straightforward with lots of seat and wheel adjustment and standard backrest lumbar support, making it easy to get comfortable in this pleasantly raised seating position. Um, all round visibility is fine, so you shouldn't need the standard rear parking sensors too much. And as I mentioned before, um, cabin practicality is a particularly strong point, as well as the features I referenced earlier. Uh, this smart sliding cover conceals um, a storage area in front the gear stick and that incorporates a USB point and a 12 volt socket and it can also optionally contain this wireless phone charging pad. Um, there is also a storage compartment built into the dash top here uh, and there's another down by the driver's right knee too. A ticket clip is provided at the side of the windscreen and the doors feature elastic straps and deep bins that can each swallow a 1.5 litre bottle. Not so good is the omission of an overhead compartment for your sunglasses and also the fact that the glove box space is severely compromised by the media equipment. Enough on what it's like at the front of this Karak, let's check out the rear. That's accessed through these wide opening doors. Now, if you're trading up from the company's previous Yeti compact SUV, this is where you'll notice the biggest practical differences over what went before. As you might expect, there is a lot more legroom than there was in that previous model, although taller folk might still find their knees brushing against the front seat backs. Uh, you can't really grouse about the headspace, so uh, even on a model like this one with a large glass panoramic roof fitted. In fact, the ceiling actually feels slightly higher than it is in the bigger Kodiak model. Uh, these fold-up seat back tables are standard, as of course are the Isofix charge seat fastenings for the two outer seats, and this little mini centre stack is provided with twin vents, uh, cubby space and a 12 volt socket. The real cleverness here, though, lies in something Skoda's particularly proud of, its Varioflex seating system. Now, this is optional at entry level and standard elsewhere in the range, and we'd say that you really have to have this to get the most out of the versatility that this car can offer. Now, the Varioflex package replaces the usual rear bench with three separate seats that can uh, individually slide and recline or, or be removed altogether. 
Now, if you know you need space for two, the center seat can be removed, allowing the two outer chairs to be then pushed up to 80 mils further in towards the center of the cabin, creating limousine-like levels of shoulder room. Um, if there are only two of you and you want to keep that center seat in situ, though, it can be folded down to reveal a couple of uh, useful built-in cup holders. And let's finish by heading back to the tailgate, uh, pausing on the way to notice another of Skoda's trumpeted so-called uh, simply clever touches, this ice scraper built into the fuel filler flap. So, time to check out the cargo area. Now, the hatch can be specified to raise electrically, as it is here, and as a further option, you can pay extra for a virtual pedal feature, which will allow you to raise it with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper. And that's something that'll uh, come in jolly useful if, key in pocket, you're approaching the car laden down with shopping bags. Uh, with the tailgate raised, uh, usefully large apertures revealed, complete with a usefully low loading sill. Now, the total space you'll actually get will depend on whether the variant in question has been equipped with that Variaflex seating package that we're just talking about. And if it hasn't, you'll get a 521 litre boot. But if, as we would recommend, you do make sure that that feature is included, you'll get a cargo bay like this one uh, that you can vary in size between 479 and 588 litres, depending on the position of those sliding rear seats. And the seat backs can also be placed in a slightly more upright position if, say, you're cramming in suitcases and you need a few extra crucial inches to lay to shut the tailgate. Now let's give you some perspective on the figures we've just given, um, and let's reference the two segments liters. So say it's Attica will give you a 510 litre boot and this one's Qashqai uh, which can offer you just 430 litres. Neither of those cars can offer you the versatility of a sliding rear bench though even as an option and you don't get it on many other class contenders either. It's a practical area too. Skoda hasn't forgotten to provide a 12 volt socket and there's even a removable LED rechargeable torch. Um, high rails on both sides feature these useful hooks which will be ideal for shopping bags and you can tether smaller items down with a load net that attaches to the lashing points provided. Bits and pieces can also be stored in corner compartments on both sides. Uh, the right hand one has a restraining strap. Another restraining strap features on the right hand cargo sidewall and as an option you can specify this practical double sided uh, boot mat which has a flip over wipe clean surface which will be ideal for muddy boots or dirty dogs. If you need more room for longer items like skis, the centre part of the rear bench can be pushed forward. If you completely flatten the backrest, a 1605 litre stowage area is revealed. And that's about the same as you'll get in that set Attica model we just mentioned. But the difference here is that if the Variaflex package is fitted, you'll also have the option of completely removing the three rear seats should you need your Corocta function in removal van mode. Now do that and as much as 1810 litres of fresh air can be freed up. The days are long past since Skoda models sold at bargain brand prices, but you'd still expect value to be a strong calling card here, and by and large, you won't be disappointed. The Croc lineup starts class competitively from around £21,000, with prices rising to around £32,000 at the top of the range. Uh, from launch, buyers were offered a choice of three trim levels, SE, SEL and Edition, and two TSI petrol engines, a uh, 1 litre and a 1.5, along with a couple of TDI diesels, 1.6 and the 2 litre 150 PS power plant that we're trying here. This 2 litre TDI engine also comes in 190 PS guys. DSG Auto Transmission is a £1,300 option across the range. As for all-wheel traction, well, provision of that is limited either to the 1.5-litre TSI petrol model or to the 2-litre TDI variant. Uh, should your starting point in the range be the base 1-litre TSI petrol version, then if you want a little more poke from your Karoq, uh, the two further engine options see a £1,350 premium required for the 1.5-litre 150 PS petrol variant, while just over £2,000 more gets you the torquey 1.6-litre TDI 115 PS diesel unit. For 2-litre diesel 4x4 Karoq motoring, you're going to need a budget starting from just over £25,000. 
To give you a Skoda range perspective on all this, uh, those sorts of figures will see you paying around 1,500 to 2,000 pounds more than you would have to find for a comparable version of the company's more conventional but similarly sized Octavia Estate. Now that model most closely competes with this one in its SUV orientated Scout 4x4 form, which only comes with the 2 litre TDI engine. There, the price you'll pay is, well, it's only a few hundred pounds less than the cost of a mid range Karak fitted out with the same drivetrain. Now if you come to compare this Karok with its larger Kodiak SUV showroom stablemate, you'll find comparisons are a little more difficult to make because that bigger model has a broadly different range of engines. Uh, the two cars do though share the 2 litre TDI diesel and with that engine fitted, a uh, Karok would uh, save you just under £3,000 over a similarly specified 5 seat Kodiak. Enough though on Skoda range semantics. How does Karok pricing pitch this car against directly comparable rivals? Well, let's see. Uh, let's start by defining the fact that in terms of competitors, we're talking here of C-segment Qashqai class SUVs based on family hatchbacks. Now, the Czech brand has uh, developed a smaller Fabia super mini based crossover model to more specifically target cheaper B-segment SUVs like Nissan's Duke and Seat's Arona. As for the Karok, well, you'd think that its closest competition would come from the uh, similarly sized Volkswagen Group compact SUV. SUVs that already compete in this class. So Audi's Q2, uh, Seat's Attica and Volkswagen's T-Roc, all of which share the same engineering underneath. Now the Attica and the T-Roc cost around about the same as equivalent Karok variants, but they try to offer something a little different to set themselves apart. Now in the Attica's case, it's sportier handling, while when it comes to the T-Roc, it's more avant-garde styling. Neither model, though, can match this Skoda's interior space and versatility. As for the Audi Q2, well, that car has a more upmarket feel, but it requires a model-for-model -model premium over the Karok, which averages out at around £1,000, despite which you get less equipment and a much smaller boot. Uh, as for other alternatives, well, it depends what part of the Karok lineup you're shopping in. Uh, lower to mid range variants are really alternatives to volume brand, family orientated compact SUVs like Nissan's Qashqai, uh, Renault's Kajar, Peugeot's 3008, the Mini Countryman, um, Kia's Sportage, Hyundai's Tucson, and Citroën C5 Aircross. Maybe also Jeep's Renegade and Compass models, uh, Vauxhall's Mocha X and Grandland X, the Mitsubishi. Eclipse Cross, the Subaru XV and the Honda HRV. If you want a little more interior space, then entry level versions of the Ford Cougar and the Mazda CX-5 might also come into the equation for much the same kind of money. If looks are more important than space, then there's also the dynamic looking Toyota CHR. Of all the models just mentioned, uh, the Kia and the Hyundai alternatives could easily save you a thousand pounds or so over the Skoda, but otherwise all of those cars are available in much the same 20 to 25,000 pound bracket where most Karok variants will be sold. If you have more than that to spend on a car of this kind and you're considering what's on offer in the pricier part of the Karok range, well, then you could be looking at really high spec versions of the competitor models I just mentioned, or alternatively, you might be browsing amongst the uh, premium brand contenders in this class, which tend to sell mainly in the 27,000 to 35,000 pound bracket. So here we're talking about SUVs like the Mercedes GLA, the Audi Q3, uh, the BMW X1, the Volvo XC40 and possibly also the Lexus NX. Now Skoda has worked hard to try to ensure that the upper spec Karok variants feel suitably plush enough to take on cars of that kind. If having considered all of this, you conclude it is a Karok that you really want, then you're gonna to need to know just how generous this Czech brand's been when it comes to standard equipment. So let's take a look at that now. Uh, even entry level SE spec gets you 17 inch alloy wheels, roof rails, front fog lights, uh, LED daytime running lamps, LED rear lights, an alarm, rear privacy glass, rear parking sensors, auto headlamps and wipers, and powered heated mirrors. Inside at this level, there's dual zone climate control, there's a leather-bound steering wheel, a multifunction trip computer and cruise control. 
There are thoughtful standard touches too, like front seat lumbar support, second row seat back fold out tables, an ice scraper built into the fuel filler cap, uh, a removable LED torch built into the boot and an umbrella clipped in beneath the front passenger seat. Infotainment is taken care of by an eight inch Bolero branded center dash touchscreen display uh, via which you access an eight speaker DAB audio system and Bluetooth phone connectivity, along with a smart link plus feature which allows you to connect in your phone using uh, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. So overall, the only major notable omission to this kit list that we can see uh, concerns the unfortunate need to pay extra for any kind of spare wheel. To get a standard, the key interior feature that sets this Croc model apart though, the Variaflex seating package, uh, you have to trade up at least as far as mid-range SEL trim. Now that Variaflex setup replaces the usual rear bench with three individual seats that can allow you to widely adapt the layout and configuration of the rear part of the car. So as part of this arrangement, all three chairs can be moved independently, they can all be folded flat or removed completely. Other SEL spec upgrades give you larger 80-inch rims filling the wheel arches, full LED headlamps with washers, um, keyless entry and extra exterior chrome work. Parking, that will be uh, a lot easier thanks to front sensors and a rear view camera. And you'll also be able to tailor steering and throttle feel via a drive mode select system. Inside, the uh, mid-range models get heated front seats, plusher Alcantara upholstery, and an upgraded Amundsen infotainment system with 3D navigation, integrated Wi-Fi, and a year's subscription to the brand's infotainment online package. The real niceties though are reserved to top edition variants like the one we're trying here. Now at this level in the range, uh, you're entitled to 19 inch wheels, a panoramic glass roof, metallic paint, power folding mirrors, and an electrically operable tailgate. Inside, there's LED ambient lighting, leather upholstery, uh, an electrically operated driver's seat with memory function, a wireless phone charger, and the brand's top Columbus infotainment package. Now here you get a larger 9.2 inch center dash screen which can be operated by voice or even by gesture control. Most of this stuff though can be individually uh, specified on more affordable trim levels further down the range so let's instead switch our focus to the extra cost options that you can add to your Karok model of choice. Now, as you might have gathered from what's just been said, we're especially keen on that Variaflex seating package. So on a base SE variant, we'd suggest you budget in an extra £450 for that. Now, if you don't want this option, a cheaper alternative on an entry spec Karok would be to add in a variable height boot floor, which unfortunately is incompatible with the Variaflex setup. Another key extra that SE spec buyers should consider is the upgraded Amundsen navigation and Wi-Fi infotainment package. Now, not only because uh, these two features will be useful as part of your ownership, but also because having those will allow you to really exercise everything that this model can offer in terms of in-car media connectivity. Now a lot of that is bound up with a freely downloadable Skoda Connect app, which your dealer will want to tell you about, and that really comes into its own if you also pair it up with two things. First, the our infotainment online setup I mentioned earlier. Now that's standard for the first year of ownership, providing you avoid entry level trim. And second, the three year Care Connect package, and that is optional across the range. Uh, infotainment online gives you online traffic information, and it can update you on things like fuel price. Uh, parking spaces, current news and weather. Care Connect, meanwhile, will allow you to monitor your car from your smartphone, um, plus that setup includes a breakdown call function and it will also automatically alert the emergency services if uh, the airbags go off in an accident. It's all well worth having and of course it can also work with the top Columbus infotainment package we mentioned earlier with its gesture control and bigger 9.2 inch screen. Now that is available at extra cost with mid-range SEL trim but it is quite a pricey option. A better way of spending any extra budget would, we think, be to add in the upgraded Canton sound system which for some reason Skoda packages in with a space saver spare wheel. Now we mentioned earlier that you don't get a spare wheel as standard on any Karok 
model. So uh, regardless of anything else that you might want to add to this car, the box for a space saver wheel is probably the first one you should tick when you're finalizing your chosen spec. You can only have a full-size spare if you go for a front-driven SE model. And no, we don't know why either. Uh, on to driving orientated options. Now remember that the drive mode selection system for tweaking steering feel, throttle response and on the DSG Auto models, gear change timings costs extra with base SE trim. Uh, across the range you can pay extra to embellish that with a feature which will allow you to personalise various settings to your precise preferences. Uh, you can also talk to your dealer about completing that system's functionality with Skoda's DCC Dynamic Shadow control adaptive damping setup which will allow you to uh, set up the ride to suit the roads you're on. Now if you uh, struggle with parking there's an optional park assist system which will automatically steer you into spaces and if you happen to do a lot of long distance highway work then you'll want the ACC adaptive cruise control setup which uses a radar to automatically keep you a safe distance from the car in front. Uh, now, you can also talk to your dealer about the digital instrument binnacle display that Skoda's developed for this model. And finally, in the unlikely event that you're regularly going to be attempting any kind of serious off-roading in this car, then you might want to consider the optional rough road package, which includes an engine guard and understone guard. What about uh, practicalities? Well, for day-to-day -day family use, we'd certainly want the door-mounted rubbish bin and the double-sided boot floor. That's a reversible mat with a white clean underside that you can turn over and use for muddy boots or, well, muddy dogs. Uh, both these features also come as part of the optional family pack, which additionally gives you um, power-operated child safety locks and side windows fitted with heat insulating glass. Talking of dogs, if you do have animals, you might also want the uh, wipe clean back seat protector, which covers the whole seat and door area in the rear compartment. Um, other practical features that you might want include door sill scuff plates and tablet holder attachments for the second row passengers. Uh, a partition net screen would be useful if you've got pets too, although you can't have that if you get your crop uh, equipped with the panoramic glass roof. There's also the option to add in a heated windscreen, which comes with heated washer jets, and a heated steering wheel and heated rear seats are also optional. Uh, to reflect the times we live in, there's an optional dash cam, the next base dash cam and go pack with built-in Wi-Fi. Uh, plus, you can also add in an electrically operated tailgate if the variant that you've chosen doesn't have that. And you can have it uh, complete with what uh, Virtual calls its virtual pedal system. Now, this basically means you'll be able to uh, operate that powered hatch with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper if you find yourself approaching this Skoda key in pocket but laden down with shopping bags. Uh, a removable unibag is designed for transporting either skis or a snowboard and for things like that there's a usual range of roof racks and roof boxes plus a bespoke bike carrier which is uh, mounted on the back of the tailgate and which can take up to a couple of cycles. Uh, finally we would expect plenty of Karok bars will want a tow bar provided here in electrically folding form with an adapter. On to uh, aesthetics, let's start with paintwork. Uh, there are two special solid colours available at extra cost, candy white and meteor grey, plus a range of optional metallic and pearl effect colours. Uh, we've got petrol blue here. And on a mid-range SEL variant, you can upgrade to a larger 19-inch set of alloy wheels if you want to. Inside, there's the option of an aluminium pedal set. And on the mainstream models, you can lift the interior with leather upholstery and decorative inside inserts that feature chrome and dark brushed finishing. Now these inserts come as standard if you go for the optional LED interior light package. On to safety. No really sophisticated new model these days now comes without some sort of autonomous braking system. And sure enough, every Karok variant features the Volkswagen Group's effective front assist system. Now this setup scans the road ahead as you drive for potential collision hazards and incorporates a city emergency brake feature which deals with the specific requirements of urban speeds of up to 21 miles an hour. If the radar detects something you might be likely to hit, you'll be 
warned. Now, if you don't respond or you, perhaps you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be activated to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Now, this system also includes a pedestrian monitor, which uh, specifically searches for pedestrians who might be about to step out in front of you. Other sophisticated standard safety features include an award-winning automatic post-collision braking system, which automatically brakes the car down to six miles an hour after a collision. So if, say, someone hits you and, understandably, you go to pieces, the car will automatically sort itself out. Also standard across the range is a driver fatigue sensor which will monitor driving reactions for drowsiness and prompt you to stop for a restorative coffee if lethargy is detected. Now these features are all in addition to all the normal safety kit that these days you'd expect on any large family car. So every version of this Skoda has a twin front side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee bag uh, as well as the usual traction and stability control systems along with ABS brakes that feature a brake assist system to help in emergency stops which will be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard flashes. Uh, there's also a tyre pressure display, hill hold control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, and a pair of Isofix charge seat mounts for the middle bench. Plus, as we mentioned earlier, if you go for the optional Care Connect package, you'll get an equal emergency assistance feature, which will alert the emergency services to your exact location in the event of an accident. If you want to go further, then various safety options beckon, an Isofix attachment for the front passenger seat, for example, or the auto light assist with automatic high beam system, which will automatically dip your headlights at night to avoid dazzling other vehicles. Now that facility will come as standard if your Crocs fitted with full LED headlights. Uh, on most models, you'll have to pay extra for traffic sign recognition and a package which gives you lane assist and blind spot detect. Now, now, lane assist warns you if you're drifting out of your lane on the highway and blind spot detect works on the move to alert you if you're just about to pull dangerously out to overtake. The lane assist and blind spot detect package comes as standard if you pay more for the most sophisticated optional safety pack that you can have with the Karok. Skoda calls this assistance package one and it's only available on models whose owners have already paid extra for DSG auto transmission and ACC adaptive cruise control. Uh, the two additional electronic camera driven features are fitted here are particularly worthy of note. Firstly, there's a traffic jam assist system which will allow this Skoda to drive itself in low speed traffic queues of up to 40 miles an hour using the lane assist technology to keep it in lane. Now it sounds futuristic, but if you have to regularly commute in stop and go traffic, it's a feature you'll really come to depend on. Now the second system designed to work with DSG and ACC is emergency assist. And that's a setup that detects when the driver is incapable of controlling the vehicle, say in the event of a heart attack or an extreme bout of illness. Now in a situation like that, the hazard lights would automatically be activated and the vehicle would be brought to a controlled stop within its lane. It's all very reassuring. If you happen to be switching into an SUV for the first time, or even if you're not, you might be wondering what the penalty and running cost efficiency might be in comparison to opting for something more conventional. There's obviously going to be one. Uh, like all models of this type, the Karak is significantly heavier than the conventional family hatch it's based on. In the entry-level 1.0-litre TSI petrol variant, Skoda's managed to keep the weight gain down to around 93 kilos, but the 2.0-litre TDI diesel 4x4 variant we're trying here tips the scales at over 180 kilos heavier than an equivalent identically engineered version of Skoda's Octavia Estate. Despite that variance in bulk, overall analysis of uh, Karok fuel and CO2 figures across the range reveal that there's a showing uh, only around 5% worse than that equivalent Octavia model. Which isn't a bad showing, and one that allows the figures delivered by the turbocharged TSI and TDI engines used to shine in comparison with quite a few segment rivals. 
In checking these out, let's start with the base 1 litre TSI petrol unit, which manages 53.3 mpg on the combined cycle and 119 grams per kilometre of CO2. Uh, to give you some perspective on those readings, let's tell you that a typical volume contender in this class, a car like Nissan's Qashqai 1.2 litre DIGT, is about 10% thirstier and dirtier. So yes, the Croc makes an awful lot of sense in base petrol form, attracting a very competitive, benefiting kind tax rating of 23%. True, you could get 8 miles per gallon more from every gallon by opting for the alternative 1.6 litre TDI diesel derivative, but we don't think many likely buyers will want to. For one thing, the 1.6 TDI model's uh, more important stat, its CO2 reading, is no better than that of the petrol counterpart, and most potential buyers will probably reason, as we would, that any potential fuel consumption gains made by that base diesel variant will be more than offset by its higher purchase premium and by the pricier fuel that it'll need to run on. So, a cast iron case for the Croc in 1 litre TSI form. Well, it would be if it wasn't for the weight issue we referenced earlier. Even in this base guise, the Skoda fronts up with 1,340 kilos of curb weight, which in the 1 litre variant has to be hauled along by an engine developing a relatively meagre 200 newton metres of torque. So, after the test drive, you might well feel something a little more hearty might be required up front to put it all along. So, if the 1.6 litre TDI diesel variant won't fit the bill in this regard, what will? Well, might we suggest the alternative petrol engine option, the 1.5 litre TSI unit? Uh, not for nothing does Skoda expect this to be the most popular engine in the range. It develops 150 PS and 250 newton metres of torque, and it uses a clever cylinder on demand system that allows the power plant to cut down to two cylinders under light to medium throttle loads. As a result, this version is virtually as frugal and clean as the 1 litre derivative, managing 52.3 MPG on the combined cycle and 123 grams per kilometre of CO2. Obviously, you're going to put a bit of a dent in those figures if you take up the option that Skoda offers of ordering this 1.5 litre TSI unit with four wheel drive. Another Croc engine that can be mated to four wheel drive traction is the 2 litre TDI 150 PS diesel that we're trying here. Uh, the stats for this 2 litre TDI 4x4 model see a combined cycle return of 56.5 mpg and a CO2 reading of 131 grams per kilometre. Now those readings are hardly affected at all if you opt for DSG auto transmission. And that's something that, by the way, holds true right across the range. In fact, with the 1.6 litre TDI variant, opting for the auto box will actually slightly improve your returns. Helping in this regard is the fact that the DSG transmission is equipped with a coasting function, which at cruising speeds will disconnect the gearbox, leaving the engine to idle until you next need it. And of course, as with the manual models, it works with an incorporated start-stop system which cuts the engine when you don't need it when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. All well and good, but will the figures we've quoted be uh, actually achievable in real-world motoring? Well, in the wake of the Volkswagen Group's dieselgate fiasco, that is a fair enough question to ask. The answer depends on how many of the driver-orientated efficiency tools you're prepared to use on a regular basis. Now, in cars fitted with the Drive Mode Select Vehicle Drive Mode system, there's an eco setting which softens off the throttle response, and on the DSG automatic models, it's getting it's the gearbox to change up early to optimize economy. This setting also saves fuel by only sending energy to the air conditioning and the power steering when it's actually needed. Uh, you can monitor air conditioning system energy usage via a selectable convenience consumers readout on the uh, center dash infotainment monitor. Elsewhere on the same display there is a green score screen which graphically scores your success or otherwise uh, in motoring frugality. Like most modern diesels, all the TDI units on offer get a selective catalytic reduction filter to cut down on nitrous oxide, and they've been designed around the use of a urea-based solution called AdBlue. This is injected into the exhaust gas stream to help clean up emissions, uh, the liquid used being stored in a 12-litre tank mounted at the rear beneath the boot. This will need topping up as part of regular servicing, and you can monitor its status via a dashboard display. Now, talking of servicing, the recommended interval for all engines are based around a 20,000 mile two year regime and you can budget ahead for maintenance costs by taking out a fixed price prepaid servicing plan and point of 
of purchase, which covers the first two scheduled garage visits. Another financial burden that you'll want to plan around is insurance, although the Karok helps here by offering up a relatively affordable set of insurance groupings. Uh, predictably, the cheapest variant to get cover for is a 115 PS 1 litre TSI petrol model that comes with a Group 9E or 10E ranking, while the 150 PS 1.5 litre TSI petrol variants can in at Group uh, 15E or 16E, depending on the derivative you choose. As for the diesel Karox, uh, the 1.6 TDI is rated at Group 10E, while this 2-litre TDI 150 PS 4x4 derivative comes in at Group 15E. And finally, we should mention residual values, which is an area where Skoda usually performs surprisingly well, and this model isn't going to upset that form. Industry experts reckon that the volume Karok 1.5 litre TSI SEL petrol variant will realise 56.9% of its original purchase price after three years and 36,000 miles. And finally, while it's certainly true that other rivals better the three-year, 60,000-mile warranty that Skoda provides, you can extend your cover to four or five years by paying extra. Not that you really need to. The brand regularly tops independent customer satisfaction surveys. I mean, according to real people, there are few more satisfying cars to own. If you find yourself approaching this car a little cynically, then we would understand. At first glance, after all, it might be easy to dismiss it as just other quite forgettable European mid-sized fashion orientated SUV. A necessary addition to the Czech brand's model range perhaps, but not the kind of product that could be in any way uniquely Skoda. Surprisingly though, the Karok turns out to be more than that. In the endearingly comfortable way that it drives and handles, it's a very recognisable ambassador for the brand. And the same is true when you come to examine the versatility and practicality of its class-leadingly spacious cabin. The Variaflex seats in particular are a design masterstroke that would really sell us this car. In fact, when all said and done, there's very little not to like here, should you be amongst the increasing number of buyers prepared to pay a premium for SUV ownership over that of an ordinary family hatch. Now, some rivals in this segment are undeniably more stylish to look at, but as we've already said, what the Karok lacks in design flair, it makes up for in terms of durability and ease of use. Some competitors are a little more high-tech, a few are more efficient, but most of these alternatives are pricier too. Too, and it is that very affordability which will keep this Skoda in the frame for customers who want a more interesting and flexible alternative to yet another Qashqai clone in this segment. In short, what we have here is a class act in a market full of try-hard rivals and a car that strikes an appealing chord between practicality, quality and fashion. It builds on the cool but understated image that made its Yeti predecessor so appealing. A car that, like that model, somehow transcends lifestyle snobbery. For many, then, a Karok could represent what will be a compelling mix of competence and desirability. It's a family car that doesn't shout family and a crossover that you could be genuinely pleased to own. <laughs>